Good day, Bio221. Welcome to Microbiology for Nurses, Lab 4. We're looking at normal flora and opportunistic pathogens. So firstly, what are the normal flora? Well, normal flora are microbes which are permanently associated with a person. So they're known as the normal or indigenous flora. It's important to recognize that at times, opportunistic pathogens can be closely related species to the normal flora. The normal flora are harmless and beneficial, but pathogens can also become um, associated with uh, normal flora. So it's important that we're able to distinguish between even microbes which appear very similar or even may be closely related. Right? Opportunistic pathogens are harmful organisms, yes, but only in certain conditions only when given the opportunity really to cause a harmful effect, that's when they become uh, harmful organisms or pathogenic. So it could be instances where an organism is either overgrown or it's relocated to the wrong place of the body. For instance, organisms which are normally part of the gastrointestinal system or the GI tract can move into your urine, urinary tract or your urethra and cause a, a UTI. All right, so we want to make sure that the right microbes are in the right place and performing a normal function. All right, so that's the objective of today's lab. We're also going to get an opportunity to look at different types of media. We're going to look a little bit at selective and differential media. So different types of media we use for culture in different types of organisms. Um, and even different streak patterns that we use um, for different purposes, such as urine culture. And we'll get into that with the demonstration. Right. So blood agar plates contain a typical nutrient growth medium enriched with 5% sheep's blood. It's useful for encouraging the growth of fastidious organisms. And fastidious organisms are fussy organisms or organisms that have very particular growth requirements. So in microbiology, we have to make sure that we try as much as possible to simulate the natural environment that these organisms would have grown in in order to uh, culture them in the lab, right? So it can show results of hemolytic enzymes produced by some organisms, such as those that produce alpha and beta hemolysis on blood plates. And you'll remember from previous labs that alpha hemolysis is incomplete breakdown of blood cells, leading to a green coloration around the colonies, whereas beta hemolysis is a complete breakdown of the red blood cells leading to a clear area around the cells or around the colonies on the plate. So today we're going to look at blood agar plates as well as cled plates. So cled are cysteine lactose electrolyte deficient plates. So it's a non-selective differential plating medium for the growth and enumeration of urinary tract microorganisms. It omits sodium chloride and in so doing, it inhibits the swarming of proteus. So proteus is a species that grows normally from the urine and it overgrows the plate, thus making it difficult to observe other types of microbes on the plate. So we want to inhibit the swarming of proteus. So cled agar supports the growth of a great majority of the bacteria which cause UTIs and is used to differentiate and identify these pathogens. In addition, it has the advantage of restricting the swarming of proteus on the medium surface. The presence of bacterial contaminants like diphtheroids, lactobacilli, and other microbes indicate the degree of care taken when, with the handling of the urine specimen. All right? So urine is typically meant to be sterile. All right? This is because of the ultrafiltration that happens in your um, loop of Henle in your, in your kidneys. So what we will typically get on a, a urine plate is very little to no growth. All right? But there are instances where there can be an infection and you get large amounts of growth. All right? So any growth on a urine plate could potentially be significant. So we use a calibrated loop to quantify how much growth is or how much cells are going to be found in a particular volume 
and we use that to determine whether this individual needs to seek further medical help or not. So in today's lab, we're looking at the gastrointestinal culture, where we'll be looking for any pathogenic microorganisms. We're looking at a throat culture, where we're looking for a distinction between Streptococcus viridans and Streptococcus pyogenes. So one is a normal flora, and Strep pyogenes is an opportunistic pathogen which causes strep throat. We also look at the skin and nasal culture. So we're looking at the microbes that grow on the skin and even in the nose. So you may see things such as uh, Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis. Um, so Staphylococcus epidermidis or Staph epidermidis is normal flora, it's harmless, whereas Staph aureus could potentially be harmful. And there's even strains such as methicillin resistant Staph aureus, which are antibiotic resistant and for that reason significant, even in hospital tests. So again, using a sterile swab, we're going to take a sample from the skin. And using a plate which has been labeled, um, we're going to inoculate just on half of the plate. Firstly, all right, so covering half of the plate. And then we discard of the swab in your biohazard bag. So we're gonna leave this plate in an incubator at 37 degrees C for 24 hours to see what will grow up from that. All right, so the same procedure will be carried out on a nasal culture. So the swab will be placed in the nose and you do a similar procedure. And the GI tract uh, culture will be provided to you of a rectal swab. And what you do is you streak the plate and then we're going to observe the growth afterwards. Okay, so we're going on to the urine culture. And for the urine culture, what we use is a calibrated loop. So this loop will hold one microliter, one thousandth of a milliliter. All right, so it's sterile up to this point. If you can have a look at it, it's a single use disposable loop so it's used only one time and it will only hold one microliter in the top of it here so I'm going to use from our culture here say this is urine the technique is such that first you draw a line down two-thirds of the plate you streak straight across without flaming it's a plastic loop straight across, being careful not to cut the agar, right, one quadrant, second quadrant, and that's it. Your loop is now discarded, this is placed into the incubator, 37 degrees C for 24 hours, and we have a look at the growth that comes out of it. So for you, we've done some of these already. We're able to see the type of growth that we get. So skin and nasal, you can have a look at the different types of growth. These are your bacteria. The GI tract, you can have a look at the type of hemolysis you see there. And then the culture itself. So as expected, here you see a large number of colonies in a very small area. So you're not able to see the individual colonies on their own. They don't come out of the culture. So only where you come to the third or fourth quadrant, you're able to see individual colonies looking circular on their own. Right? And that's where they are more representative of what the cells typically look like. Where they have raised edge or elevated surfaces, whether they're rounded or curled or mucoid, undulate or umbonate. Only when they grow in isolated colonies, that's where you will be able to identify those characteristics. The number of microorganisms that are present in a properly collected urine sample indicates the presence 
recovered urinary tract infection. Urine is typically sterile as it exits the bladder. However, as it passes through the urethra and out of the body, it flushes out microorganisms and becomes contaminated with the normal microbiota of the genital urinary system. The majority of UTIs are caused by invasion of the normal flora by way of the urethra. Right? So, we do a quantitative assessment of urine cultures using the sterile loops. And what we say is we count the number of colonies on the plate, multiply by 1,000 to convert the number per milli to convert to the number per milliliter, and report in colony forming units per ml or CFUs per ml. So if there's more than 100,000 CFU, it indicates significant bacteria. Right? So three or more different types are seen as contaminated. So on this plate, we have one type of microbe. So this person is perfectly healthy. On this plate, we see a massive overgrowth of the plate. There's more than 100 cells here. So this is going to present us with more than 100,000 CFU per milliliter. So we could say that this person needs to seek further medical assistance. All right? So the main organisms of clinical significance are E. coli, Proteus, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Candida albicans, Streptococcus, and Enterococcus fecalis.